thank you for joining me the webinar today. We're going to get going. Uh, I'm very excited to be joined by our uh, Director of Intelligent Technology Consultant, um, Jermaine Clark. My name is Brendan Howe. I'm the CEO of TechFi. This is the second um, in our new webinar series, Hot Tech Tapes, uh, a monthly webinar that we're doing uh, to help uh, educate people on where technology is going, uh, give folks a roadmap of, of what's next. Uh, and Jermaine, we're, we're trying to have a little fun with it too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the whole the whole uh, landscape of technology right now is the buzz and uh, just kind of working through doing something new and different uh, for ourselves has also added a little bit of excitement to what we do. So, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and we're talking today about some simple but powerful things that, um, that, that, that everyone can do to protect their data. Obviously, we're in the context of a lot of people are working from working a little bit differently now and uh, security is a, a bigger deal. Um, so what uh, I think we can get going. Uh, I don't know if I um, if I influence the poll with my comments, but we now have a majority of people are seeing higher than before in terms of uh, security uh, security issues, emails, spoofing attempts, uh, scams, that sort of thing. Just a slight majority, um, slightly more than the U.S. election. Um, we see the majority of people are moderately confident about security. Um, with uh, a bunch of folks being neutral or concerned. So we'll see where everybody ends up after, uh, after we do our session today. Well, that's good. We've got the middle of the bell curve on that one. So that'll be, that'll be an interesting to see where it ends up at the end. For sure. Okay, so uh, we always start with this. Like, since, since COVID's happened, we've seen four key trends. Um, the world has obviously changed uh, and people are working differently and they, um, the, the technology strategy has changed. So four key trends we're seeing, obviously people are working from everywhere or anywhere, home, office, mix of in between. Uh, we're seeing people a desire to better <laughs> utilize the technology that we're all already paying for, right? We're all paying these monthly um, charges for Microsoft, Adobe, Google, Amazon, you know, all these different providers, uh, and we want to figure out how can we use this technology better, uh, and we're getting that feedback from a lot of people. Uh, Jermaine, I think you get uh, you get questions from clients all the time. I'm sure so. Yeah, quite a few. I mean, it's it's always around, well, how do, we, how do we keep up with what's out there right now if we don't even know what's on our current uh, subscriptions? And then with the current subscriptions, what's in it today, what you're paying the same price for today could be something completely different tomorrow. And uh, just keeping ourselves up to date and our, and our clients and our, our counterparts up to date is really very important there. Um, but it's just kind of how do we do that cycle and how do we keep the process going uh, round and round to ensure that we're not missing the things that would actually interest and uh, impact our businesses. For sure. Uh, two other trends, cybersecurity, which we're going to talk about today. And big trend of people wanting to move from reactive to proactive. Like we're kind of... I get the sense that people don't want to just fix problems and band-aid stuff or firefight it. We're, we're, a lot of people want to move their technology to be more proactive, more strategic, more planning, that sort of thing. Well, yeah, I mean, it makes good sense if you think about it. Uh, as a Canadian, as soon as the first flurry or a hint of something less than 22 degrees hits you plan to go change your car tires because nobody wants the first snow to hit and you're skidding around the highway. So you do that as a proactive activity. And how do you do it? You take the information that's out there based on the weather reports and all the information that's available to you. And you make an informed decision so that you plan ahead to change it possibly the day before or as close as you can get, but you change your tires before. And that's, that's a proactive versus reactive. You don't wanna be the person lining up during the first snowstorm to get your tires changed. So that's our first public service announcement. Make sure you have snow tires on your vehicle. All right, so let's, uh, let's pull back the curtain, so to speak, on, on cybersecurity. And, and let's, um, let's get into it. We always start here, Jermaine, with the notion cybercrime is a $3 trillion industry. It's one of the largest industries in the entire world, right? And, and when, when you're looking at, looking at things, we need to look at it from the perspective of we're not up against some dude in his mom's basement that's hacking away. We're, yeah. we're up against state-sponsored uh, organizations. We're up against organized yeah. and, and, and that's what's 
it, that's, that's the environment. And making this even more challenging is the AI world. So you have uh, all these great companies, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they, they've taken, um, and this is, a, this is a quote from the Microsoft CEO, um, and, and he talks about how their mission is to democratize uh, artificial intelligence. And it, the thing is, as soon as you democratize artificial intelligence, small companies like us and a lot of the folks on, on the call get to use this great and this powerful technology. But the problem is, so do the bad actors. And so a lot of the cyber crime that's out there that's being perpetrated right now is being perpetrated using artificial intelligence. <clears throat> and the business is, and the business model is, is able to automate a lot of those phishing attempts, the reactions to them. Uh, and, and what you see are coming across your inbox or um, attacking uh, attacking organizations or stuff like that, there's a scale that it's able to do that uh, you just simply hadn't seen before. Yeah, exactly. And that, and that AI driven, the same way we're working through AI to detect the threats, they're working through AI to be undetectable as a threat. For sure. Um, so if we, uh, I, another sort of interesting thing, I think we're kind of, beyond people thinking that, hey, I'm a small business, I'm, I'm not a uh, target for attack. 70% um, of attacks uh, target everyday, everyday businesses. Um, but the other interesting thing I found here is uh, the idea that you're nine times more likely to, um, to be hacked than to have a fire. Uh, and you're four times more likely to have a cyber loss than any other insured business loss. Uh, so uh, hopefully, Everybody's got cyber insurance. If you don't uh, reach out, we can give you some recommendations on uh, on where to go. But you want to make sure you're insured, just like any other part of your company. Um, the other part we we point this out in a sort of funny way. This uh, is a great little uh, cartoon from Trend Micro. The we're, we're all reliant on our people, and we're yeah. reliant on the IQ of our people and, and the knowledge of our people to keep our network safe. And that's specifically the intelligence around cybercrime and how people, how sophisticated ways they can catch you. And if you think about it, they're not, they're not sitting around going again. It's an AI driven system that's being sent out. Links are being forwarded on. And, and the most vulnerable place in your security stack is the space between the chair and the computer, right? Because that's where we see people are not focused one day. Nobody's going to be on a hundred percent of the time scanning, looking for the dangers. And then, you know, one day you're going to end up clicking on something. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, what, <laughs> that's what all these bad actors are, are targeting. And, and here's, a, here's a story that a um, friend of mine I know, uh, CEO of a business, um, of course, I, I keep the, the business and the person confidential, but I thought it'd be useful to tell the story. Um, there was uh, into COVID, I don't know, it was a month or two into COVID, um, you're kind of dealing with all the COVID related stuff, trying to ma manage cash flow and right. various other things that we're, we all look at for our businesses. And he was dealing with a, a supplier. They owed a bunch of money to, supplier was following up and they're emailing back and forth. And he says to the supplier, yeah, sorry, okay, we're gonna, we'll make a payment and we'll, we'll cut a check for $70,000. Um, and, um, and about an hour later, he gets an email back from the supplier saying, actually it's COVID, we're not at the office very much. Uh, can you?" And a bank transfer instead of send a check. He's like, yeah, no problem. Forwards the email onto a CFO. CFO wires the seventy thousand dollars over to the oh. bank. And you know what they found out, Jermaine? Let me guess. Uh, they weren't actually paying for what they were. They thought they were paying for, or who they thought they were paying. No. And that email that came back saying send send this to this email account looked right. like it came from the supplier, had the same email signature, <laughs> form, font, everything looked the same. The email address was slightly different. Um, and this hacker had hacked into um, my friend's email account, had been watching his email account, uh, kind of sitting on it, waiting for an opportunity. And this opportunity came up and he ended up making $70,000. And yeah. And if you haven't got the right uh, insurance or coverage or, you know, people set up auto pay on those accounts. Once you pay it, the bank says it's not our fault. It's gone. Um, and then that's where you're sitting around. And I wish this was the only thing or the only example we had or the only one we see. But I mean, I've, I've got one, too, if we if we move on and I can jump in here. <clears throat> 
We've got a new client that we were onboarding less than three months ago. And we get in there and we're just doing our initial review of the environment, looking for changes and lining it up against our standards. Um, and our best practices standards, one of them was looking for email forwards. Now, that doesn't sound too dangerous. Somebody's forwarding an email from point A to point B. But really what happened was this hacker had gotten into two of the accounts in the organization, again, at a C-suite level and people in charge of moving money around. <clears throat> and they were in the account for close to about a year. And what they did was they set up an email forward from the account that would say every email that comes into this account, will, we will forward a copy to my account in China, Africa, and I think one was in New Zealand or somewhere else. And once it forwards out, delete any record of having forward the, forwarded the information. And then they just sit around and they wait. Now we got in there and we were looking around, poking around, and we found the auto forwards. And we're like, hey, Mr. Client, like you've been sending emails to these three different IPs around the world for the last year. And there's no way that we can tell whether or not you've already sent out all the information from your clients, your staff, all of that would have been in that data that's been being forwarded somewhere else. So that's a huge breach, huge breach. It's crazy. And, and the fact that it was there for a year and somebody was reading all these emails yeah. for year um I, I think it was scary to us and it holy oh, cow was it scary to the client um and, and so and just before i go on I, I should also mention the feel free if uh, any questions come up um pop them in the q a panel our plan is to uh, to go till about 12 30 today and then we'll ask questions jermaine and i will stay on for as many questions as uh, as folks have we've got some time set aside we're happy to answer questions either uh, through the q a panel or uh, or, or live here um, based on anything that, uh, that folks come up with. So please feel free to uh, drop a question or two into that Q&A panel. And we will do our best to answer um, as many questions as come up. So here's kind of the, we're, we all know we're moving on from the, uh, the old school landscape of everybody's just working behind the corporate firewall, right? Yep. Um, we're, we're no longer just working in an office. Uh, where, we're, uh, where we're not moving around and security is a little bit more straightforward. Now we're working from anywhere, working from home, working from on the road, sometimes working from the office, going back and forth. And, and that's the kind of environment that we're living in that, that we, we need to address, right? And, and we're also kind of distracted, right? Uh, more so like we're, there's, there's thoughts that we might be going back into lockdown um, tomorrow. There might be an announcement of going back into lockdown and we could Going back to this scenario where we're all working from home with our kids and dogs and I don't know, like it could be the, the Amazon delivery guy distracting you as you're doing things. And it's, it's hard to focus and it's much more likely somebody's going to click on, you know, one of those links or scams or, or stuff like that, that maybe they wouldn't normally do when they're in the office. Yeah, the distractions are bound, right? I mean, even throughout my work day i mean it's funny you say the amazon person but i mean it's the it's the lawn people the neighbors looking for their mail that might have accidentally been delivered anything and they're just pushing the doorbell and then of course my kid running around in the background if and when we're in lockdown right well we were preparing for this this morning and we had uh, both our kids were running around and uh getting um getting ready for getting ready for school and daycare and all the things and it's you know it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a challenge so here's what we've got to secure we need to we need to secure the devices so we look in the top left corner and we've got to secure all these different devices that people are accessing data on we need to secure the actual data itself we need to secure the applications and we need to secure identity right yeah. those four things and we need to look at security a lot differently <clears throat> Right. And so the type of outcomes we're hearing most people are looking for is they want to protect users' identity, control access to, uh, to valuable resources, could be IP, uh, could be other resources. Um, make sure that there's protection from threats out there. Make sure we're protecting information, right? That documents and emails are only seen by the people that are supposed to see those emails yeah. uh, or those documents. And if somebody leaves your organization, that they no longer have access to that, or they can't take a bunch of things, stuff with them. And, and if security is being managed, whether you have an outsourced par partner or an internal department, that there, there's that sort of visibility and control um, over, over security. So yeah. I'm going to toss up a poll, and we're, 
as I talk through this, we're going to get into uh, kind of the meat of what we're recommending. We're going to spend the second half here um, and, and just get get into what we think. Like we we're this is a very complex topic. There's a lot of stuff going on, uh, and we wanted to simplify it and just simplify it down to five things that we're going to suggest that you do. So five, uh, we want everybody to come away with five takeaways here. But before we get to that, let's just talk about the security journey. So I have pop up this, this poll here. And just before you answer, um, the, what, we're, what I want you to think about is where you are on that security journey, right? The level one is what we call the kind of basics, right? People have a firewall, antivirus, monitoring, updates happening. Um, you probably have a, some sort of backup that ransomware proof. Um, and, and then as the threats have changed and matured, folks, some folks are moving to level two and that's where there's two, two factor authentication in place, right? Um, there's probably some phishing training for staff. Uh, you're getting into a world of there, there's some more security processes in place, auditing, reviewing. Um, it, you're starting to back up your cloud applications. Um, and, and that's where, you know, we're, we're seeing some people are getting there. We still have the majority of folks in level one. Um, and then level three is where you have multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor is in um, three or more different levels of authentication. You have the world of privileged identity management, cloud data labeling, compliance policies, BitLocker for machines. It, it's really, it's a bunch of stuff, but the, the point that we're trying to make here is, Jermaine, level one used to be okay. Then level two is okay and you need to yep. progress. And what we're gonna be talking about here today is, is really moving people along that journey and getting to that level three world because of the environment and how people are working, you, you can't rely on that sort of level one stuff anymore, right? And it is really a sliding scale. I mean, uh, it just, it, it really does depend uh, it's not a hard cut. I know we had to break them into levels just to kind of group the most uh, common uh, selections, but people are between level one and level three. There's a whole sliding scale of what stuff has have been implemented and where. Um, and it's, it's always good to know or feel where your level is. <clears throat> Absolutely. So we, we look at the majority of the folks on the poll today are in level one with, uh, with the rest. Uh, a minority in, in level two. Um, so let's just talk about, we're gonna go through and um, let's talk about what are the, these five, five powerful things that we think we, think we can do. Um, and, and let's start with, we want everybody to understand the problem, what we're trying to address, and then what it is that we can, uh, what it is we can do about it. So, um, First thing, first problem we want to address, everything's changing so fast. I mean, you mentioned this uh, off the top, and I think everybody is, is realizing this, right? Like the, 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 the pace of change is crazy, right? Like this, is, was this from your inbox, Jermaine? Yeah, I pulled that just today. That's my weekly update for some of the changes that happened in, only in the last week. Yeah, just let me go to, oh wait, there's another slide. Wait, there's another slide. Wait, there's more, there's more. So this is just changes that Microsoft's made in the last week, right? This is like, we just went through how many, like seven or eight? Yeah, slides. there's eight slides there with probably about four, three or four average changes on each slide. Yeah, so, so 30 the, something. The, the pace that things are changing and, and to be able to keep up, <clears throat> we believe pretty strongly that, or not pretty strong, we believe really strongly, you need to have a really good security and process in place that's auditing, reviewing, aligning, and road mapping, right? Audit, review, align, road map. And if somebody's not, if somebody's not checking, if somebody's not reviewing things, and, and if, if you're not being aligned to best practices standards as Microsoft changes stuff and as other vendors change things, um, then you're, you could be good today for security wise and tomorrow you're not gonna be in good shape, right? Yep. And then you help a lot of our clients in terms of road mapping from there. What are the next steps and how they go on that security journey? Yeah, that's right. And, and thinking about it, I mean, every it, it's an ebb and a flow cycle, yin and yang, however you want to uh, slice the cake there. But um, as we go through uh, on the next slide, you'll see 
our security services and our team and responsibility all have some form of a plan, cycle, and roadmap. And as those roadmaps get released and changes are made, there's a whole team of people trying to figure out how can they circumvent those trainings. So they're doing their due diligence around the review and alignment process of how they're going to breach your environment. But as an example, you want to establish that modern perimeter because we have to work from anywhere now. It's not just the corporate firewall uh, protecting your users. And then you want to modernize your infrastructure. If you're still domain VPN, gone are the days of being safe on those platforms. We need to move forward to the next thing. And then trust but verify every cloud provider because now you're going from, hey, I can see my server and know where my data is to my data is in a place called the cloud, but it's just somebody else's data center. And we need to make sure that we trust and but verify uh, where we put our data in the future. For sure. Okay, so let's talk about problem number two, passwords. Anybody here like passwords? Uh, I wanna like, if you can, if you maybe talk, pop a comment into the Q&A pane. And uh, if you really like passwords, um, I'd like to know and understand that. And generally passwords suck. We, we don't like uh, having passwords. We don't like um, remembering them. Um, we don't like the kind of thousand different passwords that we have for all the websites. And it's, it's a real struggle, right? It is. Yeah, and, and hackers love passwords because we can't remember them and we try to change them and we just put in, you know, password one, two, three, and then poof, it's the entire organization. So here's our powerful thing, number two. We want to move from whether you're at no FA, no, FA, uh, no factor authentication or two factor authentication, moving to multi factor authentication. And, and we've got a, a video from Microsoft here that we just wanted to play that we thought was quite good. We're living in amazing times. The old security paradigms no longer apply. We need to transform our approach to security as well. Look, the only people in the world who love passwords are hackers because they're hard for humans to remember and they're easy for hackers to guess. You really need to do more to protect your business. The first thing everybody should do is go turn on multi-factor authentication. That will cut your risk of attack by 99.9%. We are moving from a world where usernames and passwords are the standard to a world where passwordless authentication is really the standard. So for Microsoft, the best way to see that is with Windows Hello. You just walk up to your PC and using your face or your thumbprint, you can log into your PC. If you don't have a PC like that though, you can use the Microsoft Authenticator. You just use your phone and you use your thumbprint or your face on that. And then a whole bunch of new solutions are on the way based on a new set of open standards. Those are called the FIDO2 set of standards. Things like USB keys and badges and wearables. In order to help everyone be more secure and productive in a world without boundaries, we collaborate across Microsoft, across our industry, and with security experts around the world. Passwordless authentication is really taking off. Last month, 85 million people logged in using Windows Hello or the Microsoft Authenticator and then they could get to all of our cloud services. That's really the trend for the future, and it's growing really fast. It's essential for companies to protect both the privacy and the security of its end users. We are always asking how we can help you to keep them even safer. So, Jermaine, the one thing that I really took away from there, like. You think about you had an opportunity to do, uh, eliminate 99.9% .9 of hacker attacks. Would you do that? Definitely. Matter of fact, I'm already on board. <laughs> and, and I think the we wanted to show that video because it just shows some of the some of the different <laughs> ways not everybody understands MFA. Uh, and yeah. they, do you want to just Jermaine maybe take us through uh, a bit of a better understanding of that? Yeah, happy to. I mean, the video had a lot going on there, but really <clears throat> it was just broken down into three main categories. And, and from a multi-factor authenticator, um, when we think about what two-factor authentication was initially, I mean, we've been doing it forever. It's prevent uh, provide one piece of ID with a secondary ID with a photo on it to prove you're that person because two other institutions have said yes. This person is unique and it has been identified here and here, and then you utilize that. So that's two-factor authentication, but it's only the two things. And multi-factor now takes you along the stream of, well, 
we're going to have three ways to identify you and, or more, uh, depending on how secure you'd like to be. But knowing something you know would be something that would be your email address and your password. Something you have would be one of those fingerprint authenticator tokens, a scanner card, or your phone to use an authenticator app. And then uh, something that you are. So this typically would be a biometric thing of yourself. So as an example, uh, infrared can read the blood vessels in your head, which is how Windows Hello works. So nobody, they can't put a picture of you on their face and log into your computer. It wouldn't work that way because it sees to the unique pattern that your blood vessels makes in your face and your head. So that's how MFA works. And now it would be next to impossible for a hacker or somebody externally, even if you were to give them a password to be able to get into your account because they don't have your phone and they obviously don't have your face. So that yeah. would definitely not all end up together. Most of these phishing attacks are stealing password credentials. Yeah. Right? Um, so, so we've got security process. We've got true MFA. Let's go to our next challenge. We have devices are all over the place, right? What what happens if uh, if you have somebody somebody's working from home and they lose their computer or gets stolen, or or what happens if you you got forbid you have to fire somebody? It, it, it happens, right? Um, you have to let somebody go and how do you make sure, or if they quit, how do you make sure that their device is secure and how do you do it when they're working, working remote? Yeah. I mean, uh, one of our clients recently, uh, just spoke to me and said, Hey, you know, uh, this person is leaving. Um, and I just found out that the person had given their significant other, one of the computers from our organization from a year ago, and it still has all of our company data and everything on it, including financials. And they're like, is there any way you can wipe the machine? I said, sure, sure, we can work through that. But that's something that happened. And that person's been in possession of that company's data. They don't work for the organization or otherwise for more than a year, right? So this stuff happens every day. So we want to protect devices no matter where they are. So Jermaine, why don't you take us through some ways that we can do that? Well, you're going to hear a lot about two things coming up with this. Uh, the more you talk about authentication and multi-factor authentication, you're going to hear a lot about conditional access. And conditional access applies to your users and your devices that are accessing any of your company data. <clears throat> and with that, you want to say that conditional access will now allow your IT administrators or anyone working with your organization to be able to empower the users to use whatever device they want while still having full control over the authentication decision to be able to give them access to your environment. So you'll see from our, our current slide on the screen that you've got a signal that the computer, the user, and the location will give, and then a decision has to be made. Should I allow full access, partial access, or block access altogether before getting to the next point? And if we go along with the user conditional access, when you look at that now, it's gonna check, well, okay, is this the user? And is the user been multi-factor authenticated? Have they provided their fingerprint, their dongle, whatever? And is the device in a safe location? Is the IP address different? Do I require them to have MFA on that device? Before every attempt to access the company data goes through that cycle, and only when everybody's met the conditions for access would they be allowed to access the company data. And that goes for wherever the devices are. Awesome. So if, if we let somebody go, um, we want to revoke access to their device right away. We can do that no matter where they are. Pretty That's cool. right. So let's look at our, our next problem. Problem number four. Do you have data? It's all over the place. Um, it's other... like everything is all over the place. <laughs> yeah, everything is all over the place, right? So we want to protect data no matter where it goes, where it is. It, it, it's no longer just resting on a server in the office. It's in... Uh, it, it, it's all over the place. So let's talk a little bit about how we can do that. So this, this actually brings us into the realm of identity management. <clears throat> when we think about where the data is actually stored, especially if you're in a cloud environment and you've given it to Microsoft, Amazon Web Services, whoever, what we want to make sure we have is that everything is zero trust, okay? You are not, you're not trusted no matter who you are. You can be the owner of the company or otherwise until you provide the right access identity to get into an organization. And then when you go through, the next thing would be something called Microsoft and Azure Information Protection. And this exists in, in various formats through different security organizations. But really it is, there's two added layers. You've got your encryption 
sensitivity labels, looking at cloud security, and then having even an, an access or information protection application sitting on your computer or device that allows you to access that data safely. And then we move into rights management. Now, authenticating me to your environment is great, but now once I'm in there, what am I actually authorized to look at? And that's where we want to see even the device, the user, the directories they're accessing right down to a single file it has permissions on it that says this particular user can actually view and is authorized to download, duplicate, replicate, edit that document. And if that doesn't exist and they don't meet the right conditional access that we just talked about, they don't have access to those, those files. So if somebody leaves, and they go away, you just turn off their access and all of a sudden, even if they took it on a USB, they can't access your files. Yeah, that's one of my, my favorite stories to share, Jermaine, is we all have these Excel documents or Word documents or maybe even PowerPoint uh, presentations that we would never want our competitors to have, right? They have our secret sauce or they have our company financial information. Yeah. Uh, or for healthcare organizations, you, you have personal, um, personal health information, um, patient information, stuff like that. That's right. And with a system like this, what it, what it allows you to do is if I have that Excel document, I put it on a thumb drive. And, and as you said, even if I'm no longer with the company, uh, even if I got that thumb drive, I copy it on my local computer, I go and double click on the Excel document. And I say, I want to open that. I want to open up the customer list from the company I left uh, yeah. yesterday. And that now that I'm at the competitor, I want to share the, 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 uh, the customer list with them. It'll check with the Microsoft Cloud and it will deny access. So you can't even know that document sitting on that, uh, sitting on your computer or sitting on that USB key, you actually still have control over that document, uh, even though it's outside your environment. I, I think that, like, that to me is, is super cool. I think that that capability is something that people have wanted to have for a long time. So what about when we go ahead and give uh, other providers access to our environment? Hey, yeah, it's the same, same sort of thing, right? You, you give access, you want to be able to, you want to be able to revoke it. Like the, we have this challenge with all these cloud applications, right? And we've got so many different applications in the, in the cloud. Like everything is now cloud-based. You've got a different user, different password, different logins right. for everything. So how do we deal with this, right? Uh, the kind of fifth thing, fifth and last thing, uh, but not least is want to figure out a way to protect your cloud data regardless of the provider. Right? Definitely. You have to secure all those applications. It's no longer just secure your office. You have to make sure that access to those applications is secure, right? Yeah. And, and, if, uh, and I mean, if any joining the webinar today and including myself, I've got about 30 apps that I've downloaded from the app store or the, the Apple store or otherwise. And those apps are sitting on my phone and I really have no control over what they're doing and how they're accessing my data on my phone. So if I were to put my corporate work email or information on that device, I need to be able to ensure that that device and the access to that data is secure so that it doesn't interfere with anything else I have on my phone. Um, that means we want to discover and control the use of shadow IT. So people mining Bitcoin on your 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 phone or using any of that. And we want to have that visibility, data security, threat protection and compliance so that any of the data that's exchanged from the cloud through that cloud app security framework comes back to your users. And then it's, it's safe for all of the devices because they, they continue to vet those cloud applications and ensure that if they come up with an issue or an exposure, rights access can be revoked again. And then from there on out, you're now meeting meeting the, the compliancy that's required and the comfort of level that your data and your security around your devices are protected. So cloud security is important. Yeah, and one of my, like one of my favorite things is just being able to manage the, the access in one place. Uh, you can, like one of the, the big outcomes of strong security is making it easier for users, not harder. Like security doesn't have to make things harder. So uh, imagine if you had single sign-on to all of your cloud applications, everything that you were you were using, you used the same user and password. You had MFA in place, uh, so you, you have that thing that you know, uh, the thing that you are, and the thing that you have. 
uh, and you can make sure that you have secure access, but that actually makes it easier to access all these applications. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so let's uh, let's just do a, a quick summary here. We've gone a couple minutes over, but I think it's important what we've, we've been going through. Kind of the, these five key takeaways. We, we want to implement that security process to audit, align, and roadmap. And, and kind of our goal today was we didn't want to get, we wanted to give you enough detail that there was meat around this, but we didn't want to get in the nitty gritty technical detail. We wanted to give you the information so that you could be knowledgeable and you can say, okay, I, I, at an executive level, I need to make sure I have these five things. In there. Yeah. Number one, security process. Ongoing basis, audit, review, align, roadmap. Over and over again. That's how we keep up with the pace of change. Turn on MFA, make sure you're not just 2FA um, or no FA. Protect, device, protect your devices. Make sure there's a strategy in place that's going to protect your devices. Uh, we, we think the stuff that's um, available through Microsoft is phenomenal and um, you, you, you can't, can't beat it. Uh, and we've been using it for quite a while, uh, had a lot of success with it. Uh, protect your data no matter where, have that strategy. And this is where we're getting into that level three stuff, right? You want to have that strategy to be able to, um, to, to label things as private, confidential, to be able to pick up when those credit card numbers are, are, are saved or personal health information or stuff like that. And then protect all those cloud applications that we sort of felt like over the last few years we're losing control. Let's get that control back. Uh, and let's be let's protect those applications without stopping our people from being uh, from being useful and being able to do their jobs. Right. So Definitely. what we're uh, what we're gonna do now. Um, oh, I have one more thing that I just wanted to remind everybody of. I'm going to put up a poll so that we can get a little bit of feedback from, uh, from everybody. And then I also um, wanted to, uh, to just remind you our next webinar in our webinar series, December the 9th uh, at 1 p.m. Um, five collaboration ideas that your team will love. We're all, you know, collaborating, working differently and stuff like that. We may be going back to uh, everybody working remotely again soon. Um, if, uh, if you're not working remotely again now, depending on what the province announces tomorrow. So we're gonna talk about some collaboration ideas uh, that we have and, and some feedback we got after our last webinar about different applications and stuff like that that people wanna hear about. So we're gonna, we're gonna dive a little bit more into that. And that'll be fun. We're looking forward to that. That'll be uh, up on our website, the registration link in our newsletter, um, all that sort of thing. So let's... Um, Let's just look at our Q and A here, uh, Jermaine, and we we'll go through and uh, we can answer answer a couple questions here. Um, first, first question we had about uh, was about commenting on password lockers, um, such as uh, as Dashlane. Are they safe to use, uh, especially as we move to changing passwords more frequently? Right, so, right. What do we think about those password password keepers and password? Um, like uh, we talked a little bit, I think this question came up in the last webinar we had as well. Um, one of the key things about it here to understand is again, it's, it's that sliding scale of security and where you want to be. Password keepers work uh, because you have a need to have a lot of passwords right now. Um, and because of that, they do work. You've got it. But consider the scenario that the password that protects your password keeper now is the one password that's your vulnerability. So you still got that one point of vulnerability with it. It's still secure because again, you can make that password anything and you can put everything into it and you only need to memorize one. But to answer the question as succinctly as possible is you're good with what you have today. It won't be as effective come a little bit into the future. And then based on that right now, the next, the next thing would be to go to something that's tactile that someone can wear and carry or fingerprint related so that they can just have the same password across the board and then you're multi-factor authenticating that so that it's secure, right? Having those three things in place or multiple things over those three categories, something I know, something I have and something I am and just put those three in there. And then from there on out, you won't need a password keeper anymore. So you're going to reduce costs from if you've purchased a service, that's one and two, you only really need to remember one password going forward because you're authenticating it with multiple, uh, multiple ways to identify yourself. Yeah, for sure. And, and I just kind of add that 
it, at least if you have a password keeper, um, you're you're going to be using more complicated passwords. You're not going to be reusing passwords um, over and over again, right? Like some of the some of the biggest hacks, um, and we get lots of questions about about this. Um, it, it, some of the biggest hacks that that we see is it, you know LinkedIn got hacked, and then all of those uh, those passwords, those credentials were shared on the dark web, and anybody hackers know this. They know that a lot of people use the same password. So they, they take those passwords and they, um, they then use them and try them on different websites. Uh, and they use that, those AI engines and those different bots and stuff like that to, um, to try out. And they end up hacking into people's accounts back. Uh, we had uh, another question here, just about the most common, common threats. Um, and uh, there's a, I think the question is, uh, join late, wondering what's the most kind of common threats that you're seeing. And, um, and, and so I think the, I, like I'll start on that and then Jermaine, please chime in. The email hacks um, the, through Microsoft 365 where through people's, the most common thing we're seeing. Um, so we, we're dealing with less, the ransomware is still a big deal, right? Um, Hackers are, are, are getting in and they're encrypting files and then they're holding them for ransom and asking people to pay big amounts of money and they, they know the insurance companies will pay, will pay this. Uh, but the most common thing we're seeing is um, users, staff members getting duped into putting in their credentials, their usernames and passwords onto websites, and then their email gets hacked. Right? Yeah. Maybe we talked a little bit about that earlier on. And, uh, and, the, and and what it really is too is the it's the phishing and the whaling that really gets through in the emails, right? I mean, getting into the account is one thing, um, but they've got so many creative ways of getting into the account now. And that's where we're seeing a lot of the exposure. It is tied to email, whether it's Gmail, 365 or otherwise, but it is tied to email. But we are seeing that they've, they've changed the way they're gaining access now, right? You just sent out a request to some, someone within your organization asking to send back the credentials or send back information related to the login for your website. And they got your website login and then they plant the, they plant the hacker software on your website. So then people going to your website now is clicking on it and they don't know, even though your website's legitimate. Um, and we had an example of that with one of our, our newer clients that came on board. Within the first month, we were in the middle of implementing their, their stabilization and their entire website was hijacked. When we got in, the website was flagged with every single client that they had because it was, it was sending and receiving and had malware and spamware on there. And, uh, and so they're doing that as well, right? They're, they're getting in there. And then once they're in there, they then deliver it back to the same organization and steal the credentials to get into their email and so forth and so forth. So they spent in remediation probably about three months, rebuilt a new website, migrated everything from where it was, all to get around the uh, issue that their domain had been flagged worldwide as a, as a ransomware bot. And, and that sort of relates to the, the sort of the last question that we'll, we'll take here. Um, but the, the web piece is a, is a really good comment, Jermaine, because there's a lot of, um, a lot of folks um, they don't, uh, they don't think of their websites as part of their security, right? They, uh, uh, the, the web piece is, oh, I just had my website hosted there. But mm -hmm. if you're, if you're not updating your website, if you're using like WordPress or Joomla or, um, you know, any of the content management engines and, and the website's not being regularly updated, then there's vulnerabilities there. And like the, um, Children's Wish Foundation in the States, for example, got hacked and for months, yeah. every time somebody went to their website, they were literally stealing processing power from the computer of the person going to their website in order to mine, mine bitcoins. Um, it, it was just like another kind of cyber criminal thing. Another way they could make money was amazing. Yeah. Uh, so we'll take one one more question here. Um, and thanks, thanks, Natalie. Um, so employees working from home, in uh, in terms of biometrics, is there any equipment required to add the security layer? Jermaine, did you want to take that one? 
Oh, I would love to. Um, the good thing about it is uh, I can't find a mobile phone on me right now. I know it's somewhere here on my desk. Um, but sure, realistically, you don't need anything new. Uh, if the users working for you have a mobile phone that they currently use anyway, whether they're checking Facebook or otherwise, the Microsoft Authenticator app is the one thing that they would need. That app for any program software thing that you're using, you can add to it. An Authenticator app doesn't require to be um, specific to an organization or otherwise. The main thing, because it's local to your mobile phone, you can actually authenticate through any authenticator app as long as you have the right security key set up for it. Now, with that in place, you don't need an extra camera, you don't need a new keyboard, but you would need uh, at least a mobile phone with a fingerprint reader as a possibility on the back and the Microsoft Authenticator app or any other authenticator app. Because what you do is, the app would then get a, a request saying, can I approve this login? You hit yes. And when you hit yes, it'll ask you for your fingerprint to confirm the yes answer. So now you've authenticated three ways now to get into that account. Yeah, and there's some other options with it too that are neat. Like I'm using Windows Hello um, on my computer. So it, it's, it's really cool. You just open up the computer and, uh, and like obviously it depends on the computer that you have and stuff. You yeah. open up the computer, it sees my face and Yep. Uh, it authenticates me that way as part of as part of that authentication process. Um, there are lots of computers out there that have fingerprint scanners built in. Uh, yep. and, and if, I don't know if folks noticed in the video, the Microsoft video, the little USB um, device. Uh, yeah. If you wanted to invest in that sort of thing, that's another option that you could get and just put a USB in and add a fingerprint scanner um, onto your computer that would work in whatever whatever computer that's there so um i, I think that, that that's a great question because if you think about that we can eliminate 99.9 percent .9 of hacker attacks by um by putting mfa in place uh looking at biometrics and i don't think that's too much of an ask for yeah. our our teams to say hey we need your face your fingerprint your your something to yeah. uh, confirm you are who you are yeah, and, and to stick with our theme of, you know, use use what you're already paying for. Uh, there are lots of options you can add, yes. Uh, but just using what you have on your computer, if your computer is a laptop, it already has a camera on it, the Windows Hello will work. Um, there is anything special from that. It's actually built into Windows 10, not necessarily your camera as well. So that adds to it as well for if you're looking for a, a right away implementation as opposed to planning something that requires hardware or, or otherwise. Yeah, That's a great question. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, we've run out of time. Um, Jermaine, that was fantastic. Thank you again. Had fun again. Love it. I, I feel like I'll do the action, the next one for, for sure. <laughs> I, I think maybe, uh, maybe we should do this again December 9th. What do you say? I think so. I think so. I'll check my schedule and let you know. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Feel free to uh, reach out. We're, this is a topic that we're both very passionate about. Uh, and, uh, and we enjoy talking about, uh, so feel free, reach out, uh, and have yourself a great day. Have a great day. Thanks everyone.